And uh, I see Arthur is already here. Hi, Arthur. Hey, hey, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, unfortunately, it's not in person, but uh, next time. Uh, let me introduce uh, uh, a great friend and also a professor at Tel Aviv University, Professor Arthur Eckhart. He is uh, at the University of Oxford and he is also a chair professor at the uh, National University of Singapore. He's the founding director of uh, the Center for Quantum Science, Quantum Technologies in Singapore. He's also a Sackler professor, distinguished Sackler professor at, at Tel Aviv University. And Arthur, the floor is yours. The Zoom is yours. <laughs> the Zoom is mine. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Yaron. It's, it's, uh, it's a pity that I cannot be there in, in person, but, you know, it is what it is, I guess. So let me try to pass the first test and see whether I can actually um, share the screen with you. So here we are. Okay, so um, the talk that I'm going to give is, is actually not a technical talk. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of an overview of what happened to the field, um, which is an interesting fusion of uh, uh, cryptology and essentially basic physics, quantum physics. It's, it was a, a kind of unexpected union, but uh, over... 30 or 40 years, uh, it actually evolved very rapidly from blue sky research to something that is a commercial and viable proposition. So I, you know, a few months ago, um, someone reminded me that it's actually 30 years um, ago that uh, I sort of started looking into that problem. And um, so that put another twist to my talk because I felt, yeah, well, it's 30 years, so maybe I should just uh, give you a sort of like a little bit more personal perspective on the whole thing. Um, so in my talk, I would like to show you how um, our drive to generate a perfect cipher uh, brought us to this interesting fusion of uh, physics and, and information science. Of course, you know, the, when you look at the history of uh, secure communication, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful and very dramatic uh, uh, piece of history. Uh, it goes back to Romans and uh, well, actually goes back to Egyptians, I suppose, but uh, you know, the Greeks and Romans feature rather prominently in this. And, uh, and then people kept developing new and more sophisticated methods of communication. Um, we went through sort of uh, interesting period in the Renaissance era where people came up with the polyalphabetic ciphers and then we you probably heard a story about uh, German Enigma that was broken and then public key crypto system. So at every single point in history, it seems, whenever someone came up with uh, a good and decent and clever way of hiding and protecting information, sooner or later, there was another clever guy who came up with equally ingenious method of breaking it. So, so that, that was, you know, a reasonable question can be then asked, is there such a thing like a perfect cipher so that uh, a method that cannot be broken? And for this, we had to go outside mathematics and uh, venture into physics because, um, you know, when it comes to mathematical structure, there's always a possibility that uh, one clever mathematician will be beaten so hard by, you know, idea-wise. Um, by another clever mathematician. And, uh, but when it comes to the laws of physics, it's you, you somehow um, take a view that they are as they are, right? They are objective and uh, no clever physicist can change them. So you can show that uh, given the information is physical, it can be only processed in a certain way, then there is a chance to prove or to demonstrate or assuming the, the validity of what we know about the nature and that the whole thing is, is secure. So um, when, you know, when you are asked, when most people are asked about a perfect cipher, you know, one may say, actually, you know, there is one. Uh, and indeed, um, there is one. There, there is one that was proposed in the 1920s or so. Uh, it's known as a one-time path. So, so those who are interested or have at least a tangential interest in, in, in cryptography would know about one-time path. 
as something that relies on a shared randomness between two individuals. We always call them Alice and Bob, of course. And so once uh, Alice and Bob have uh, sufficiently long, perfectly correlated and perfectly secret, so that's no normal to the two of them, sequence of, say, binary numbers, and then they use it to as, a, as the so-called cryptographic key uh, to encrypt messages and, and send uh, to each other. So, so that would be good. Claude Shannon managed to prove that uh, one time path is uh, secure as long as the key is as long as the message and it's used only once uh, and it's never recycled and it's truly random and secret, of course. So there is even a mathematical proof that under those conditions, the, um, this is a perfect cipher. But um, there is a problem, of course. The problem is the key distribution problem. And that means um, we would like to find a way to generate secret sequences that are perfectly correlated in two distant locations. So that would allow Alice and Bob, whenever there is a need for that, to generate those random sequences and use them as the key. And they have to be perfectly correlated, they have to be secret, they have to be random. And so those conditions are really difficult to um, uh, sort of implement in, 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 classical, um, in, in classical scenario. So what is the solution to the key distribution problem? So at the moment we have let's say we have two solutions to it one that we use on a daily basis and uh, those are a mathematic beautiful piece of mathematic uh, that is uh, underpinning public key crypto systems where instead of distributing one key we actually generate uh, say two different keys and one is public and one is private and 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 there, there is a bit of uh, nice mathematics now <clears throat> but but the thing is that all that kind of systems are based, as, as probably most of you know, on uh, mathematical difficulty of certain mathematical problems. So they're based on computational complexity, which basically means that unless you are given some extra piece of information, certain mathematical problems are extremely difficult in a sense that <clears throat> if you increase your input to a, a given uh, mathematical upper mathematical computation then the execution time or the use of some other resources like memory um, grows exponentially and that's not good so the public key crypto systems nonetheless um, uh, are very useful very very convenient to use but but you know the problem we have is to prove that they are really secure simply because in complexity theory it's very difficult to um, to prove things like, oh, factoring two numbers will be always uh, difficult. Um, it is just based on the fact that so far, when it comes to any um, conventional algorithm to do, say, factoring, the you know, taking a number and, and writing it as a, as a product of prime numbers, as you increase the size of the number, the number of digits is getting exponentially difficult, at least for all kind of classical computers, classical devices. So public key crypto systems rely on, on the fact that nobody knows how to solve certain mathematical problems, but we cannot even go and say, well, nobody can solve this problem because they're inherently difficult. That we don't know. It is perfectly possible that uh, um, factoring is not uh, as difficult as we think, but at the moment we only um, have um, a good quantum algorithm for, for factoring. So that, that is, you know, the public key crypto system illustrate another impact of quantum technology on information processing and cryptography, something that I'm not going to talk about, but it actually says that there are certain mathematical problems that are difficult with respect to classical computation, and therefore you can build crypto systems based on those mathematical problems but uh, but some of those problems are not difficult for quantum computers so therefore some public key crypto systems such as the most popular in fact rsa or elliptic curves are vulnerable to quantum attacks so as soon as we build a quantum computer it may take a while you know just forget about the hype it's not exactly around the corner. It's not going to happen next year or even perhaps five years or who knows, maybe not even 50 years from now. But but nonetheless, there is a real um, danger that uh, 
if it happens one day and the encrypted data that should stay longer than that one day um, will be vul vulnerable. So, th so it makes sense actually to do something about it now. And therefore, as you probably know, National Security Agency and, um, and others came up with a call for what is called a post-quantum or quantum resistant cryptography. So to design um, a public key, classical public key crypto system that is difficult even to, to break, even by quantum computers. And you know, there are some problems that we think uh, um, um, will be difficult for quantum computers, but again, we cannot prove it. So I'm not going to talk about this. So this is like an interesting area on its own, but let me just focus on another solution that is uh, called quantum cryptography. So another way to solve the key distribution problem is to use quantum phenomena. And uh, you can use uh, phenomena such as uncertainty principle. So the two of my colleagues, uh, Gilles Brassard and Charlie Bennett came up with the idea. Uh, and you can also use quantum entanglement. That is something that I propose. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the path that quantum entanglement takes us to simply because uh, not not because it was kind of a my baby but but more because actually it offers certain uh, interesting direction it leads us to device independent uh, uh, cryptography which i would like to, to to tell you a little bit about so um well never mind the origin of the whole field um but um so let me take um the, the sort of like a historical perspective how it started on the physics side, and then I will just bring cryptography to, to the whole thing. So about 90 years ago, Albert Einstein, and uh, together with uh, his colleagues, Podolsky and Rosen, wrote a paper about, essentially about his unhappiness with uh, quantum physics. Um, that was uh, about the nature, that the statistical predictions was only, the, the, you know, everything that was there. Um, somehow um, Einstein felt unhappy or just thought that there's not perhaps such a thing like inherent randomness and this randomness comes from the lack of knowledge and, and perhaps it's just a phenomenological, not quite complete uh, theory. And therefore, if we work harder, sooner or later, we'll just fix it. So we'll be able to make predictions properly. And uh, so he actually was very good at coming up with paradoxical consequences of, of the of uh, of different way of calculating statistical uh, properties. So, so it's just, if you think about it, those of you who are not physicists may take a view of oh, quantum theory is actually a different kind of probability theory. We just simply ignore one axiom, the Kolmogorov axiom about additivity, and we use some complex numbers and there is a machine to generate probabilities, but they are calculated in a different way. So Einstein just showed that, you know, if you are calculating those things in a different way, so it's just, also has some kind of serious philosophical angle to it that you may start even if you start thinking what does it really mean how can you understand certain things and you are somewhere near questioning the existence of uh, certain the existence of certain properties you know just so but anyway so what was interesting in this paper was that Einstein tried to describe something when you talk about existence, you want to define the existence somehow. And he um, you know, he's, he was a physicist, not a philosopher. So he had to actually make be more precise. So he um, uh, defined an element of reality in a way that um, is, um, for me, it was actually very important to, to think about the connections between his work, this work and, and, and crypto. So, so the, it was defined, as you can see here, element of reality that something exists it was, is, was defined as if without any way of disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty a value, the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. So, so the thing that if you learn about the value of something without disturbing it is actually a definition of perfect eavesdropping. So if you think about what eavesdroppers really want, they want to learn the value, whether it's value zero or value one of a physical property of the carrier of information without disturbing it in any way. So this is the way that uh, an eavesdropper can fool 
the legitimate users, Alice and Bob, in this case. So, so in a way, you know, you can take it as a definition of eavesdropping. And if you take it as a definition of eavesdropping, as you'll see in a moment, it's just easy to connect this work with um, uh, with uh, the subsequent work, which shows that there are cases where there isn't any element of physical reality. So, so you know, one can claim that if I knew more about information and, and cryptology probably 90 years ago, apart from all his brilliant work, he could have also figured out how to do quantum crypto. But, um, but so let me just, at least to those of you who are not physicists, I, I'm not, you know, that my part of my problem with this talk is not, I'm not quite sure what is the congregation I'm preaching to, so to speak, because uh, some of you might be physicists and uh, this would be like uh, bread and butter to you. And some of you might be from uh, non-physicists where maybe this kind of thing requires some explanation. So I'm trying to err on the safe side. Um, so let's let's take a look at the um, the argument that takes us from the Einstein's element of reality to crypto. Um, so take, for example, that's not exactly how Einstein phrased it in that paper. So it's a sort of more modern version of, uh, of his um, of his uh, argument. So so take, for example, a polarization. And uh, we know that light is made of photons and a polarization is, is actually, you can talk about polarization of a single photon. It's an interesting property of a photon. And it's not just one particular property that you can measure. There, there are different types of polarization that one can uh, measure and you have to specify a direction. And with respect to that particular direction, you can measure polarization and you get two different Value. So if you do measurement, there are devices that measure polarization. You can get uh, two results. We can label them as plus one or minus one, or you can you can label the zero and or one if you prefer. But physicists prefer to use plus one or minus one because some calculations are just easier this way. If you put zero, it just will cancel so many terms that the physical interpretation will be difficult. So anyway polarization of a photon is a property of a photon, right? So you just choose your measurement, a type of the polarization you want to measure, you measure it, you get the results. So the question Einstein was asking was essentially, is the polarization there before it, the photon enters a photodetector or the measuring device? Is this value plus one or minus one attributed already to the photon? And the measurement is basically uncovering the pre-existing value. So, so do photons have always predetermined values of polarizations or not? Well, sometimes they do, uh, but the interesting case is that uh, you know sometimes they don't, and uh, and that is that is actually the, something that is very puzzling and uh, completely alien to a classical way of thinking about objects, and uh, it can be demonstrated by looking at the statistical predictions that result from generating photon in pairs in certain quantum states known as entangled states. So we, we generate two photons. They come from, from a source of, physicists say, source of entangled photons. And one photon goes to Alice and one photon goes to Bob. And we ask Alice and Bob to measure polarizations. So about 60 years ago, so sometime after the Einstein's paper, John Bell um, came up with an interesting test. He said, you know, speculating whether there is a polarization there to which you can attribute a number or not is not actually a purely philosophical question. It's a testable proposition. So you can set up an experiment and, uh, and actually figure this out. So um, the, and here's probably, you know, kind of a more technical slide. What he argued was that uh, we can do the, the, the following thing. You can just place those physicists, Alice and Bob, you know, Alice and Bob are crypto guys, but they're also physicists. So you place Alice and Bob in two distant locations and you, you um, distribute um, photons to them could be from entangled sources or otherwise. We don't specify exactly how Alice and Bob are going to uh, generate the values um, of, uh, from, from the devices. But all what we know is that Alice and Bob say measure polarization of photons and Alice can measure 
one type of polarization, call it A1, which is defined by a certain angle of your analyzer, or A2, which is defined by some other angle. And likewise, Bob can measure B1 and B2, which are two different types of polarization defined by their respective angles. So each value, now assume that it is indeed the case that um, A1, A2, B1, B2 have definite values. So whenever photons come, they carry all possible values of polarization with them. So the photon is, uh, this, this polarization is there, it, it has a value and uh, the system is going just to simply tell you what this value is, so the, the, the device. Now, um, okay, so, so that means that uh, to those of you who are not into quantum, but at least into probability, then you say, okay, well, I can see that S, which I define here, is a random variable, which depends on random variables A1, A2, B1, and B2. And A1, A2, B1, B2 are binary random variables. So they can only take two values, plus one or minus one. So therefore, if you look at this expression, you can see that those terms in brackets, B1 plus B2 or B1 minus B2 are either zero or plus or minus two. So therefore, S can only take two values, plus two or minus two. So then if you run experiment and you, accumulate enough statistics and you run experiments in, in this way. So you, you keep on repeating the whole, um, the measurements, but each time for each run of the experiment, you ask Alice and Bob to choose randomly between A1 and A2. So Alice is, for each incoming photon, Alice would be choosing either polarization A1 or polarization A2. So they will be, like, be choosing the measurement, the type of the, measurement she's going to do. She's going either to measure A1 or A2, and Bob is going to measure either B2 or B1. And uh, so they register and they can communicate then in public, they can estimate the value of S. So sometimes for in each run, the value will be either plus two or minus two. Um, but if you average it over, so it's going to be somewhere between minus two and two. So that's a very trivial statement, right? If you know probability theory, then it's just so obvious that we wouldn't probably be paying attention to this statement if it is not the case that uh, nature doesn't know about the classical probability theory and nature doesn't know that S has to be between minus two and two and there are phenomena in nature where this is not the case. So this expression here, or this statement is one of the Bell inequalities. It tells you that whenever you have correlations, uh, then those correlations have uh, certain classical bounds. And uh, this one is known as the Bell inequality. Now, the Bell inequality though, as I told you, if you look at these theoretical predictions in quantum, theory and think about quantum theory as a new kind of probability theory. So it then it's perhaps not surprising that those statistical predictions are different. And indeed, if you do the calculations or you do or you run experiments and you'll find that uh, S actually can be in, can be actually greater than two. And, uh, and about, uh, you know, people, even John Bell worked on this in, in, in the 60s. It was not such a fashionable thing in physics. So it's only uh, some 20 years later, about 40 years ago, that some of those outliers in physics who, who um, um, got interested in those fundamental questions started running experiments. And perhaps, you know, at least in the well, I, I should say, at least in, when I was a student, we uh, for, for our generation, the, probably the, the most beautiful experiment along those lines was the one that uh, was uh, carried out in uh, Institut d'Optique in Orsay in 1980s, uh, run by Alain Aspect. So, so he was the one who um, somehow decided to take Bell seriously and do the test. Uh, some other colleagues did it before in the United States, uh, but, uh, but Aspect experiments actually was... Um, Probably, you know, I don't know whether it was just the beauty of the experiment because he was a very, um, very meticulous in the way it was designed, or perhaps it was better um, 
presented to the communities, but it attracted more attention than the previous one. So, so, so Alain Aspect at least persuaded m many physicists that uh, yeah, there's something interesting there. It's it's uh, Bell inequalities are violated. So the consequence now and then you have a bunch of philosophers and physicists and starting discussing what does it really mean and uh, you know i i don't don't want to go to what, what does it really mean because there are various schools of thought of course i do have my own but 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 it's it's not important here i then took a more instrumental view on this so by by simply you know the line of the argument to connect um and that was about 30 years ago, 10 years after Asper, uh, to connect uh, those uh, beautiful experiments with crypto was was, the, was rather simple. You know, if, if it is the case that photons do not carry predetermined value of polarization before they're measured, so somehow then those values simply do not exist. So they, they, they are not there prior to the measurement, and they are not available to anyone, including Europe, because, you know, um, if anyone knows about the value and and it is so it is there right so so you cannot have knowledge about something that is non, non-existing so it's maybe it's just a bit you know philosophical poetic way of saying this but there, there is a solid mathematics behind it so but but the conclusion is that the testing for the violation of bell inequalities is essentially can be used for testing for eavesdropping because what eavesdropper does is just introduces this element of reality to the system and uh, so with a, of course, you know, the way I'm just presenting it is, is, is grossly oversimplified because uh, you know, the bell inequalities can be violated, but, but there may be a noise that there's lots of deltas and epsilons and then it has to connect this to the proper key distribution scheme, taking into account error corrections and privacy amplifications and so on and so forth. But that can be done. So the good thing is that uh, once uh, you have a certain violation of the Bell inequality, Alice and Bob can um, run many, uh, run the sort of uh, distribution of entangled photons many, many times and use part of those runs to test for, for the violation of Bell inequalities, estimate this figure of merit S, and on the basis of the degree of the violation of the Bell inequality, they can. Um, they can actually generate a certain secret key, uh, which which is uh, essentially what we want from this experiment, and uh, and this can be demonstrated. And in the early days, uh, it was uh, difficult actually to persuade uh, people working on the foundations of um, of uh, quantum mechanics to. <laughs> to, to on the experimental side, at least to um, to do something uh, which looked like a more practical aspect of it, but but not for everyone. So I, I was actually lucky to to work together with John Rarity and Paul Tapster, two two brilliant uh, guys who used to work um, at what used to be called Defense Research Agency in Malvern, uh, not far away from Oxford. Um, and uh, by doing those experiments, uh, where we wanted to prove that indeed uh, uh, the entanglement-based uh, secret key generation uh, is possible, um, we we had to overcome probably more bureaucratic difficulties than than uh, than experimental. Like for example, uh, in the UK, uh, it is not the Ministry of Defence but the Foreign Office that should be dealing with crypto. And the DRA was funded by Ministry of Defense. And to persuade the bureaucrats that uh, uh, you actually have to, um, well, that, you know, that this is both physics and interesting stuff, and, and there's no expertise in some other quarters that can do this kind of things took a while. But nonetheless, you know, we, we did the experiment, and, and it was a nice confirmation that those things work. But, you know, at the time, I thought, well, it's just a blue sky research is not going to be of any value or of any interest to anyone for a long period of time. Um, and of course, you know, the early setup had all kinds of assumptions. If you want to prove the security, then you assume that, of course, Alice and Bob have labs that are secure. So there's no information leaking outside from the lab. You can you have to also assume that Alice and Bob, um, at least in my I assume that Alice in, in my proofs that Alice and Bob control and trust the devices. So they know exactly what the devices are, 
uh, doing. Um, they don't have to trust the source in this scheme because um, it's just enough to the, the the bell test in a way is testing for the degree of entanglement in the system. But but you have to know what devices are doing in terms. What do they measure? If I just put a knob on my device which says a zero, a one, a two, you assume in this case that a certain well known to you property is going to be measured at the polarization. And then there's assumption that Alice and Bob have a kind of a free will that they can choose randomly between those two observables, like A1, A2, or if you consider a few more just to make, uh, for some technical reasons, they, they can do it in unpredictable ways. So nobody knows that even the eavesdropper uh, cannot uh, uh, guess uh, what are the choices for those measurements. Otherwise, it would just compromise the whole scheme. So, um, well, you know, Alice and Bob have a free will. It's maybe just to, to I mean, so um, philosophical to say it this way, in practice, you have a random number generators that do the job. They choose which particular property or how you set up your measuring device. But it's, it's actually important that those devices are um, uh, independent from, from, from the setup. And uh, so, so, so there are assumptions, but the interesting thing that uh, I didn't realize was that um, Actually, some of those assumptions can be dropped. And um, so it is, it is an interesting case that sometimes you have an idea and your ideas are more clever than you are because they contain certain ingredients that you don't see. Um, and, uh, and indeed, in this case, it was, uh, it was the case that the second assumption, you see, I just did a little bit of a color coding. So green is something that we assume, but the yellow one, Alice and Bob control and trust devices in the lab. This one actually can be dropped. And this is because the Bell test is rigid. So, so what it means is this, so that if you have this one figure of merit S that tells you about the, the degree of the violation of the Bell inequality. So you start from uh, you know, the classical world and it just, this figure goes up, up, up. And at some point you come to the Bell to the, to the bells bound, right? So, so those correlations, this figure of merit in the classical world will never exceed the value of two. So that's where you have the bells inequality. So everything reasonable, classical, beautiful should be uh, below the value S equal to. But, you know, we, we live in a quantum world. So, so you cross this border and uh, you go into the quantum area and then you may ask the question, okay, so, Bell inequalities bound the classical correlations, but is there any limit to quantum correlation in, in this scenario? And the answer is yes, there is. And there is a, another bound, lesser known, but equally important, it's, it's Cyrilson's bound, who, by the way, was um, a faculty member of the Tel Aviv University and recently he, he passed away a few years ago. Anyway, so he um, came up with... Um, with this upper bound, but but there's more to it. When you are at the end of the spectrum, if you if you know, we know that the quantum world cannot deliver any stronger correlation than uh, with the s equal to two square root of two. If you are there, if you see correlations that are uh, giving you this value two square root of two, he showed that there's only one way. Well, maybe he didn't show it this way, but, but based on his word, many people actually managed to realize that there's only one way to implement, uh, to get this kind of value. And this is exactly to do certain measurements on, on, on qubits that are in maximally entangled state, and those measurements are specified. So, so the, the fact that the Bell test is rigid means that once you see the correlations, you know that there's no other physical way to achieve those correlations at this level, but by doing a certain type of thing. So, so it's like prescriptive. It tells you know that there's no other way. Up to some local operations, you have to do it exactly in this way. There's no other way. Physics will not allow you to do it in any other way. So that means actually that once you see the statistical outcomes, you don't have to worry exactly how you got it. You don't even have to worry what you measured because 
because Cyrilson and the bell rigidity tells you that actually, you know, when you see it, there's only one way you could achieve that. And, and that means that you shouldn't actually care um, about the internal working of the device because, uh, because if you are seeing maximal violation of quantum uh, of bell inequalities, I mean, you are going to that Cyrilson limit. Then, then it's okay, just absolutely okay. There's no other way of getting this by just having maximally entangled qubits and measuring a certain observables which are specified by Pauli operators. So, so that is that leads to the scenario where basically the same scheme that is based on, you know, that I describe, but without paying attention to how devices are really built or, or even maybe you can consider like two scenarios, one which I wouldn't recommend, but nonetheless, this kind of setup makes it possible for you to go to someone who, whom you don't trust, but who is good at producing uh, quantum crypto devices and uh, making a purchase, you know, just saying, okay, I'm going to buy those devices from you. I don't trust you. You may even be adversarial, every now and then i don't trust you but i don't care because i can the devices test themselves they they they, they do self testing so if i see that there's a, a violation of bell inequalities then i know there's no trojan horse uh, then they they are just fine um it's just you know it, more likely it is to uh, think about it as a, something that protects you not against uh, um you know the devices of unknown provenance but something that protects you from making stupid mistakes when you actually design the system so when you design a system right uh, you may know exactly what should go there and you, you but, but we are all prone to all kind of stupid mistakes and there could be some imperfection and maybe there, there always may be something that you may think that um, your adversary will exploit in terms of the hardware and, and you may goof something but with this device independent scenario, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about verifying devices. You just simply want to make sure that they just give you this uh, maximum violation of uh, the Bell inequality, this two square root of two. Now, again, in practice, you'll never get two square root of two. You'll get something two square root of two minus epsilon, and this epsilon will vary. So. Um, to do the security proof in this case is a little bit not difficult. In fact, well, I wouldn't say it, it was a it was a challenge. So it was possible for 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 those colleagues of mine like Tony Assins and others who who introduced this sort of device independent aspect uh, to the scheme that I propose. So they managed to estimate the the key rates. So you see all this red curve now here. Um, for the special case where those devices um, in the device independent scenario but assuming that devices are responding in identical way so it's uh, and independently for each run so which you know when you want to prove the that kind of um, it under iid scenario that 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 is not very convincing for the device independent but 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 thankfully and this is actually the quite a recent development about two years ago, um, the, it was possible to make a very general proof. And that was due to a, a brilliant team of, uh, of Rotem Arnon Friedman. I think she's now at the Weizmann and, and Renata Rene from ETH and Tama Vidik from, from Caltech. Um, so they managed actually to show that um, if you consider a general device, you don't make this independent and identical behavior kind of um, assumption. Uh, the general device using few mathematical tricks can be actually making mind assumptions about some the way you perform the measurement that, that you have to do it in some sequential way, but never mind technicalities they essentially what they showed is that the most general case can be reduced in terms of uh, uh, the key rate to the iid kind of case so um so that's that's the latest so we do now know that uh, device independent is a realistic proposition 
And we can fix this, but uh, this the second point. The, 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 the last point, though, that Alice and Bob have free will and choose the observable is, is more tough um, because that will really push us to extreme. And uh, for one thing, we know that they have to make uh, the, they have to, if they choose a random number generators, they don't they should choose, build them themselves or choose from the trusted providers, not certainly from <clears throat> the one that provides them with the, with the crypto devices. But even there, there's a certain room for maneuver, and I'm not going to go into this, but there was a there is a beautiful work on the uh, randomness amplification. So they don't even have a completely um, free will. They have, as long as they have a little bit of a free will, there's still a chance that something can be done about it. So is that uh, the... Um, you know, that, that's sort of where we are after those 30 years. And, uh, and that is sort of like a platonic theoretical part of, to it. There is a lot, in fact, uh, going on now in quantum cryptography in terms of experimental implementations and commercial exploitation, both on the land where there are many brilliant uh, ideas. And, you know, I have to probably say in the context of this meeting that there is also a an Israeli, Israeli consortium that is looking into the development of quantum crypto. And so it's a collection of uh, academic institutions and uh, startups and some more established companies. So that's that's very promising. And I think Israel will be probably playing a, an important role in the development of quantum crypto. And, you know, of course, we also go to space, which is, is amazing. And uh, that was not, always an easy path. In fact, a colleague of mine, Alex Link, who will be talking right after me, pioneered, uh, and he and his team and his colleagues pioneered this, uh, this kind of technology, trying to look at the, looking at the possibility of sending those entangled photons um, or establishing keys using some other configurations from using satellites. And uh, not all his experiments went smoothly. So one was a spectacular failure slash success. I, I love this one because you know Alex put his nano satellite. You know, he and his team put his nano satellite on a on a rocket that um, was uh, well ended you know exploded during the um, during the um, liftoff and. Uh, and uh, we lost the payload, so that was a satellite design in the Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore. But then, sometime later, surprisingly, the, the, that satellite or that piece of equipment, the payload was found. People were looking for debris and, and, and recovering what they could recover. And amazingly, it was just in perfectly working order. So, you know, all you guys who are interested in robust quantum technology, talk to Alex. Anyway, so I'm just concluding this by saying that this was, you know, for me, 30 years of from my PhD in Oxford in 1991 to where we are now, where all those experiments are real and the Chinese are sending entangled photons from Michu's satellite and so on and so forth. It was actually an interesting and humble experience. I really started appreciating how clever my experimental colleagues are. In back in 1991, I thought, well, it's not possible. Today, not only is possible, but it's just probably, you know, people probably think too much, uh, give too much, um, or have too high expectations of these things. But again, I may be pessimistic in this. So today it's perfectly possible and it's, it's a viable commercial proposition. If you want to, if you're interested in details and you want to know more, then here is a, a review that I wrote with Renata Rena on those ultimate limits to security. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Artu. Uh, so we're a little bit, uh, Artu, can you hear me? Yes, I think I can hear you. I'm just, ah, okay. yes. Okay. So we are a little bit over time, but there is time for one quick question. So you mentioned the fact that actually we changed the rules of probability and calculate differently, but actually it became very difficult to find new algorithms, uh, you know, except Chor and maybe Grover and some other hidden subgroup problems. Uh, find other algorithms, uh, find algorithms for problems that, you know, are doing better than classical ones. 
So what do you think is the reason for that? Is it because quantum computers are not that better or it's because we are searching in the wrong way or? I think, uh, I think Yaron, it's probably, we are not yet used to, not so many, to be honest, not so many people are involved in that because it's somewhat artificial. I believe once we have even simple quantum devices and we start playing with it, then probably we will have a chance to come up with quantum algorithms that are relevant for quantum devices. At the moment we have classical devices and we are thinking, we are extrapolating in a classical way. We want to find a better way of running classical algorithms like factoring. It's a well-defined classical problem. But if you come up with a problem, given I give you 42 qubits and I ask you, Yaron, are they entangled or not? So I'm asking about some kind of a property of a data, but this data I give to you in a quantum way. And that, there may be an algorithm to this because it's a very, oh, you know, a well-defined decision problem and you can, you can define it in maybe more precise way. So there could be a quantum algorithm for this of, but, but you know, this problem doesn't even make sense for a classical computation. So I, I think that I want to believe, I don't know, maybe I'm just naive, but I want to believe when those guys, you know, come with quantum Lego and a bunch of youngsters start twinkering with quantum devices, they will start asking questions and then probably we will have much more interesting applications of those devices, quantum devices, relevant to the problems they are trying to solve in the quantum domain. So that, that's my personal view. I see. Thank you. So I just want to mention to the audience that uh, any questions that you're asking and we don't uh, answer during the session, we'll, we'll just answer you by email. So all the other questions uh, will come to you directly out of. Thanks a lot for your great talk.